another day in paradise. Beautiful morning. We have had some new additions to the museum recently. Six new bikes, so we'll run through these this morning and then we're going to do a bit in the workshop on um, progress there. So probably we start with this BSA Rocket 3. Um, just fancy this wonderful bit of tack. 1971, 750, very similar to the Triumph T160, but this was an American export model with a small sports tank, lots of chrome, high bars for the American market, chrome guards, and um, really epic looking BSA. So we're very pleased to have this in the museum, in the BSA collection. So. Um, quality bike. We'll move on. These are some Italian bikes we purchased. I love Italian bikes, especially this one here. Motor Ferrilla aircraft styling and um, very futuristic for its time. I remember as a boy reading the green one magazine there was the green one and the blue one and the styling this really w was outstanding lovely features um, for 1959 the, the lovely levers all the handlebars so forth why has it got Horex on there the German company well Horex stopped manufacturing bikes so they imported these from Italy, from Perella, and stuck their name on the side and sold them in Germany in big numbers. So um, you've got the Horex on here and the Perella on here. So combination of manufactured in Italy, sold in Germany. Then we've got this very special feature here, the hinge seat. Lovely feature. If you have a pop in here, Lots of storage area. This is your fuel tank in here. So you have a pop in there and see where your fuel is. Very similar to the aerial arrow and leader. They had a press frame internal tank. Another compartment in here for whatever, you know. And um, there you go. Beautiful styling. Heel and toe gear change, which is very Italian. Um, I like it very much because rather than try and hook your toes under the gear lever to change up, you just put your heel on it. So it's heel and toe, heel and toe. Next Italian one, Motor Marini. Great manufacturers when I raced Mondial in the World Championship in 57. Um, Motor Marini, they did some Grand Prix bikes too, but they were never really up to Mondial. This is overhead cam, that's the camshaft drive in there, 175cc sports, beautiful design, clean, tidy, and again you look at the levers, 1957, if you look at the handlebars, the lovely layout levers, and the little cutaways on the tank so you can get down into it, so it's a real sports job, and um, this is another thing that I like. Heel and toe gear change to call that. Not new, they used it in the 30s on lots of the uh, Grand Prix bikes because the old selection in the gearbox wasn't great. So that's the steering damper. Lovely bike, lovely hubs, the back hubs especially with a fitting on the side of it here. Um, lovely fitting, lovely detail. So It'll join the Italian display section in the museum. So we move into the workshop to another Italian job. This is the third Italian bike we just purchased. Capriolo, Capriolo. Very famous manufacturer. Um, again, as a boy, I always remember these and this is the only Italian bike ever manufactured that was a posed twin. 
150 cc, not a not very big, but wonderful um, unit construction engine, and quite unique in here. We have got what they call face cam, which again, not new. Uh, Donelt in 1929, British manufacturer Donelt. They use face cam. So how it works is. This is the rocker. This is a twin cam, face cam, and this is single. You see, there's only the one cam in there, but this one has got a cam for the exhaust and a cam at the bottom for the inlet, so you can get better timing facilities if you've got two cams, one cam for the inlet, one for the exhaust, and um, brilliant idea. I don't know why it never took on better, but um, those are two examples of face cam. Very pleased with it. Um, lovely press frame. Uh, lovely features like the toolbox. Put your gear in there. Screw it up, off you go. That's where the, pet, the air pump goes, but with shorter ones, so I'll be able to find one of those. That's a Monza cap, which is quite interesting. Uh, they call it Monza because they use it on the racers. Quick, quick DD, bang, in and out of the pitch, you come in, flack that off, fuel in, fill up, down, down, gone. So, uh, very, very popular. The Capriola factory, really, pre-First World War, 1912, 1913, were a man aircraft manufacturer and believe it or not they were one of the biggest producers of light bombers in the first world war and even in the 30s they kept manufacturing aircraft right through until the second world war and um, the records show they would made a hundred different types of aircraft so obviously a very advanced engineering company after the second world war they dropped onto motorcycles and uh, this is one of the, the, the fantastic products that they produce. So we're going to repaint this one because the paint doesn't do it justice. We've had it running, which is a big break, breakthrough. It, it's nice if you can get them running before you start taking them all apart. At least you know everything works. Engine's quiet, so there shouldn't be a, too much carnage inside the engine. Good news. Lovely press swinging arm. Look at that lovely pressed steel uh, swinging arm and the, the units here, they look a bit British actually, they look like Armstrong but I doubt it, they're probably just copies. This side here you've got a four speed gearbox, you've got a little Delorto carburetor, looks quite minute and quite long inductions which is not great on design but we'll suffer that. It's more difficult in cold weather, but in hot countries, it, it performs better. Nice forks, alloy sliders, alloy, alloy bottom sliders. Um, so, looking forward to getting this apart, getting it painted and putting it all back together again. Right, another acquisition. My late friends, Peter Fletcher's 500 Enfield works. Trials Enfield. We rebuilt this a few, a, about 10 years ago for Peter. He's got a works 531 Reynolds frame. Probably made with the late Ken Sprace and Ken unfortunately passed away last week, believe it or not. He was the instigator of many frames at Reynolds tube and uh, super lightweight, super strong, so uh, very, very special frame. All the rear set footrests for Peter. 500 engine, big brute of a thing. BTH mag, uh, the mandatory speedo in here. It was only for um, scrutineers, you had to have a speedo, so they, we used to stick them anywhere. Didn't matter if you could see it or not, you used to have to Always have to have a horn too, so mandatory um, horn, speedo, uh, road legal. 
uh, eat these. Uh, covers on the back mud guard here were very much Royal Enfield and the long kickstart was much Enfield so you could get a good swing on the kickstart. That was because this was before folding footrest. Now you just fold the footrest up and have a short kickstart. Um, Enfields, they were a great trial bike but um, I don't think Miller was ever beaten in all his competition life by a Royal Enfield. And it was good to have the opposition on him because you didn't have to worry too much. And one of the worst things about Enfields or Forks, uh, I don't know how you people like, but there weren't a lot of good. So I'll show you some information on Forks shortly, but um, not great. Luckily we've got the works numbers on the frame and engine. And we've got the a reissued logbook, but actually, you wouldn't believe it. About just before we started doing this, Elaine um, Peter's widow, still a great friend because I travelled Europe with Peter, probably with this bike and GOV in the back of it, you know, to Poland, Tatra Trial, etc. And um, she's trying to find the original Buff logbook which would be issued in Royal Enfield's name so we can really give it a bit of history, a bit of a certificate of um, perfection. Right, front forks, we're speaking about Enfield and um, fork development and design. Well, Miller was quite fortunate when he went to Boltaco 64, the beadwork factory made were part of Boltaco and the fork factory was just up the road. So they were the first company to come up with hard chrome staunchions, right? These were British ones, old really crap steel, machined, if you look at the machine marks on that, they're rough as old boots. So it didn't have a bloody chance of working half decent. But if you look at that there with polished chrome, it just slides in and out like a dream. So that was the first breakthrough on fork design. And of course then you have the damper mechanism inside. No bushes, straight into the aluminium. So lovely, perfect movement. So you, the forks work proper. And of course, Miller did this to Boltaco because if you look at that end field, you've got the spindle in front of the fork. So that meant if you had the spindle here, you're making the forks ever so much longer. So when you put it there, you get better trail, you get more movement <coughs> for the length of the fork. So you don't want that sticking down here, increasing the length of the fork. And it's very important with your damping to have the right grade of oil. Miller used to be very fanatical on the Boltaco and the aerial because aerials we used Norton forks because the aerial forks were like the Enfield forks rubbish and the uh, Norton forks were really copied from BMW George Meyer 39 TT winner BMW they were the first with really good telescopic forks so Norton's had a look at those and Norton's made uh, the equivalent in Bracebridge Street rather than Munich so, very critical to have uh, the pucker oil in them. Um, so, generally, rule of thumb, it's 150cc per leg. So, it's always good to just put a little mark on the 150 on a cc measure so you're not buggering about. So, um, you decide the weather which is going to come up this weekend. So that's for that's <coughs> SE20. So whenever it gets hotter, you go for thicker oil. When it gets cold, you go for lighter viscosity oil. So this, it's easier to move the forks. And another good thing is if you're working on your forks, the spring goes in here. 
I used to mo modify the forks quite severely, work severely on forks. Preload is very important so that you don't get, you don't lose movement. Some, some, if the springs are too light, you're not getting that much movement. So you really want to start off fully extension, nice progressive spring. So when you go down, it gets heavier and heavier and uh, you get the maximum advantage on your forks. And another good idea, if you have a look here, so that's a good little tip after you've rebuilt your forks, put a cable tie on there, give it a run around your practice grind, see how much movement you've got, and also check out your damping. Um, these forks, the oil in them is far too heavy, so I'm gonna lighten off the damping, and those will probably go down to 15 grade fork oil get a bit more softer movement. This one's just in for a few jobs. Customer's bike. I'm putting one of Terry Weedy's Fulton Kickstarts on. Much better than the old rubbish standard thing. See the difference in the, the difference in the leverage. So this will be easier bike to start and uh, easier to control so uh, we're just sorting out cotter pins for that at the moment. I've lightened off the clutch too. I've just put an extension on there so that the clutch is about 15% lighter to operate. Simple little exercise on leverage. So another little job. So we move on to the other projects in the workshop. Uh, Jim is almost finished the New Hudson um, cover on this side. He's done all the wiring, we've definitely done everything. We're very pleased and also what's happened, we've been on, in contact with the New Hudson Owners Club and their magazine and we give them this engine number here. 2956T and they inform us that that's a very very special engine there's none on the register of New Hudson they don't know where this is the only one they know of that survived and apparently it's got a special engine high cam high compression high lift cams and um, lots of other special features on this specific engine we looked at the Perella outside and I mentioned about these covers. Um, and in the world today, very few, very, li very little is new. That's the one on the other side. So it's almost identical to the Perilla outside. So that pops on there. So that covers all this stuff up here. So you get a lovely, um, cover on the side of your engine and we put these new Hudson transfers on from the from classic transfers Adams helped us with those and um, we've got these transfers here quite nice too so very pleased the way this has come on just got the gear changed to sort out um, Jim's trying to find a regional um, knee pads which has proven a bit difficult but not the end of the world, they can be put on later when they turn up, but we'll be probably finishing this uh, project this week um, and um, all ready for testing. So Alan Cathcart will be coming down as he tests all our bikes and doing fantastic report, lots of research. And uh, in the early days, this was the instrument panel in here. It was actually a terrible idea because you had got to feed all the electrics through the tank, oil pressure pipes up to the gauge, all working inside, very difficult to work. And um, they did, aerial is used it, lots of companies used it, Triumphs, but they dropped it because it was far too difficult to maintain and work. And that's a unique type damper very wide damper and these 
handlebar levers. This cover here covers all the like, cables and makes it very neat and tidy. So there we go. Almost another one hits the deck. Wise Mary Drivers um, International 68 down here because Jim's the wiring expert and Miller's useless at wiring so um, we've popped this down here Miller's more or less finished it, we've ran it um, runs a dream got the air filler box nicely sorted out here that's a nice job I'm pleased with that all the bricks all, the, all new cables that oil in the swinging arm uh, the motor's all sorted out it, it runs quite well of course we put a new piston in it board it checked everything out new oil new mains new oil seals new lot so there's no reason a new electric so there's no reason why it shouldn't perform that's the exhaust pipe that Miller made up that's all worked in quite neat and um, we've got <coughs> The cover on the flywheel this side here which um, is worked in well and we've kept the seals from the International Six Day those are gold dust so we've kept those and we've put uh, that's the original number that works Greg's registration number to match up the frame number and engine number and the documentation uh, this has all worked in quite well, a little light. And um, in the International Six Day, the bikes had to be road legal, so that's why they've got lights on them, speedo and horn. The same as Fletcher's Enfield. Uh, so, and at the end of the six days, and even during the week of the International Six Day, they used to check out that the lights were working. And if you didn't, if the lights weren't working, you could be penalised or even thrown out of the event. Um, a sad story in um, Erfurt, David Ty was on an aerial, believe it or not, one of our bikes, and uh, he had ridden six days with no penalty points. And on the speed test, which Miller used to enjoy with the actual iteration, he used to give him a demo how to do it. The dynamo, but he shook loose and flew off the bike during the speed test. You had to do an hour speed test, average whatever it was, 60 or 70 mile an hour for the 500s and 350 was 60 miles an hour. So you had to average a specific speed for an hour on the Grand Prix circuits or all the road circuits. And um, David lost his magneto and lo and behold, when he come to the scrutineer, they say, where's your dynamo? And he said, well, it should be here, but it's flew off. And they, um, they just really disqualified him because it's, it, after six days riding, held through everything, clean, lost the dynamo, lo and behold, lost his gold medal. So there we go. Another day in paradise, all done and dusted, onward and forward.